Welcome. Welcome, everyone, to our breakout session, Powering the Globe, Discussing Crossroads of Energy and Globalization, of our panel on technology and innovation. My name is Karina Kanicha. I'm from Austria, and I have a background in Sinology and East Asian Studies. Now I'm a first-year student in Environmental Technology and International Affairs at the Diplomatic Academy of Vienna. I'm very pleased to be here with all of you today and to discuss issues of energy transition and energy dependency with you. First, we will listen to Mr. Daniel Reinhardt from the Austrian company Swimso and a 2015 MICE graduate. Then we have Magister Michael Wiesmüller, Head of Department for Key from the Austrian Federal Ministry for Climate Action, a Shanghai-based um, intercultural leadership consultant and a 2000 MICE graduate, and Mr. Radan Kanyo, member of European Parliament and an expert on the European Green Deal. Let me thank all of you for taking your time to discuss these topics with us and give your interesting insights. And now I would like to give the stage to you. Thank, thank you. you very much. So is my presentation? Ah, yeah, here it is. Okay, uh, I'll stand up. Sorry, I to stand. Uh, thank you very much. So really happy to be here. Uh, I'm briefly going to speak about the European electricity market and the way forward. Um, just to set the stage where where we are, um, there has been a major there have been major developments in the, in the European electricity market after 1998. Before this time, in most countries, you had big public owned utility uh, electricity utility companies, uh, which were responsible for the entire uh, uh, supply chain of electricity, from the production to the transmission to the distribution to the local households. Now this radically changed after 19, uh, 1998. You had a big liberalization and unbundling. So liberalization simply means uh, many of these companies were privatized. And unbundling means that uh, you uh, separated the different parts of the electricity value chain. So uh, it, it's, since that is not possible anymore for one actor to, for example, uh, be in charge of the grids, and of the electricity production. So this was separated in order to create uh, proper market conditions for a functioning uh, electricity market. <clears throat> a second big development was that you saw a massive boost in cross-border electricity trade. So in, in, in the EU or in Europe, we have some countries which are exporting massive amounts of electricity, and others are actually importing very big amounts of electricity. I'll come to that in a bit. And of course, also big development has been the goal of the European Union, I'm sure we'll speak about this today, to reduce the carbon intensity of electricity generation. So let's have a quick look where we are. So this is the electricity generation in the European Union of last year. Close to 40% was produced with renewable energy. Another close to 40% was produced with, uh, with fossil fuels, um, mainly coal and gas, gas still being a very big part of the electricity production in Europe. Uh, and 23% was produced. Uh, here you can kind of see uh, the different uh, uh, power strategies or power generation methods uh, in the European Union. Different countries focus on different technologies. Uh, those which are green are those which are predominant, predominantly using nuclear energy, mainly France, Belgium, uh, Switzerland, Hungary, etc. A couple of countries are still predominantly powered by coal. So the color that you see here, what you see is the single largest uh, electricity production method in each of these countries. Of course, they are also using other methods, but this is the single largest. A couple are still very, uh, uh, very dependent on coal energy. Germany, Czech Republic, Poland, for example. Although in Germany, there's a pretty big transition going on. So soon, uh, renewable energy uh, actually already Total of renewable energy is already producing more than coal power plants. Um, and soon, probably, wind will be the largest source of electricity in Europe. Uh, you have a couple of countries like Italy, which are very, very dependent on gas to produce their power, uh, which, of course, was also a big problem last year. And I'll come to that in a bit. And a few countries, like in Northern Europe, Spain, Portugal, are already predominantly powered with, uh, with renewable energy. And of course, also Austria, which is using a lot of hydro and also quite a lot of uh, wind. So uh, last year, we had a big electricity crisis, which I think everybody is aware of, which is maybe also the reason we're discussing this topic today. Uh, oh, sorry. 
Ah, here we are. Uh, last year, compared to the year before, in some countries, the market prices of electricity tripled. What you see here is the average market price in 2021, and here you can compare it with 2022. In Germany, it increased from 96 euros per megawatt hour of uh, uh, per megawatt hour to more than 200 euros per megawatt hour. Italy, from 100, which is already, already quite a lot, to more than 300 euros per megawatt hour. So uh, in every country, it increased in some more and some less. Uh, those which are predominantly uh, uh, powered with renewables, you saw, uh, you saw a lot uh, lower increases in electricity prices compared to those which are dependent on fossil fuels. I want to trace a bit the reason for the massive increase in uh, electricity costs. Now, there's actually several reasons for it. One of them is, of course, the massive increase in gas prices. Uh, temporarily, the, gas, uh, the price of gas uh, increased tenfold, not throughout the whole time, but generally you had a massive increase. So, first of all, gas power became a lot more expensive. Now, what would usually happen in an electricity, well-functioning electricity market is that this technology would simply be driven out of the market, which means you would shut down all gas power plants and not produce power anymore with gas. For different reasons, it's not possible to get rid of it completely, but there were some other issues which, uh, uh, which kind of made this completely impossible. One of them was the situation in France. So France, in the last years, has been actually one of the big powerhouses before 2022 of Europe. Uh, France has a lot of nuclear power plant plants and has been a major exporter of electricity to the entire European, or not to the entire European Union, but to many of its uh, neighboring countries. Uh, in 2021, you can see that it was exporting electricity to almost every one of its uh, neighboring countries. In 2022, Suddenly, all of them, or not all of them, but quite a few of the uh, nuclear power plants had massive problems, uh, need to be maintained, many of them needed to be shut off. And then suddenly, France turned from a massive exporter of electricity to a massive importer of electricity. So they had a huge undersupply of, uh, of electricity generation. Uh, and of course, this, all, this, together with the gas situation, caused, of course, a very difficult market environment. You had a general undersupply of electricity, and one of the big ways to produce electricity became extremely expensive, and this had a big effect on the general uh, electricity market price. Another structural problem, maybe to say so, is Italy. Uh, Italy, sorry. <laughs> uh, Italy is a country which for many years has been uh, importing massive amounts of electricity. So Italy has a huge undersupply of power production, uh, last year, but also the years before, it was importing 43 terawatt hours of electricity. That's a lot. That's basically two nuclear power plants running 24 7, 365 days per year. So Italy has a massive undersupply of power. And France is a big, France is a big exporter of electricity to Italy. And with the situation you had in France, the whole market just got in disarray. It was a. Oh. So, oh, sorry. That went too fast. Okay, so this was a huge issue already. Then uh, you kind of had another another topic in Germany. Germany is phasing out of nuclear energy and also has the goal to phase out of coal by 2020 uh, by 2030. So in Germany, a big transition is going on, and uh, now suddenly Germany had to jump in for uh, for for France because it uh, because of the undersupply of power in France. Uh, so actually, Germany took the decision to increase the, uh, the, uh, the operation time of their nuclear power plants by another year. Actually, they were supposed to be switched off last year, but they couldn't, because otherwise you probably would have had a, a, a collapse of the electricity market, and that's why they decided to continue operating their nuclear power plants. But it is planned that they'll be switched off this year. Let's see whether it actually happens. Okay, uh, I'm, I think I'm already, already uh, close to my end. Uh, I'll just say a few words. Working in solar energy, uh, you're, we're of course now looking for solutions how we can make the electricity market better. Um, and I can say that solar power uh, has many, many benefits uh, uh, to increasing energy security and uh, improving uh, uh, the energy security of our market and also driving down prices in the long run. The, uh, the country in Europe which has uh, the highest solar capacity at the moment is Germany. And compared to many countries around, it actually also has some of the lowest uh, market prices for electricity. Um, solar energy in general has become the cheapest way to produce power. 
You can see it here on the scale, especially utility scale FTD systems can produce electricity at a cost lower than pretty much every other way to produce power. Uh, what we need, in my opinion, is a massive incentive to, to install a lot more, so, a lot more solar, uh, particularly in southern Europe, uh, especially in Italy. Italy is a country which has, which has a huge solar potential because it has a lot of sun. Uh, same also for France, same also for Spain. These are countries uh, which could benefit massively from, from, by drastically increasing their solar, uh, their solar production. And this would drive down the costs, the electricity costs in the whole European market. Okay, I will stop here uh, and hand over. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Interesting insights in solar power that we have, especially in a few countries. Um, then I would like to continue with Magister Wiesmüller. And I'm excited to what you can tell us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. First of all, thanks for the kind invitation. I'm working for the Austrian government for 25 years, and it's the first time I'm here. Great. Uh, you never stop learning. Um, thanks a lot for, uh, for, for being here and, and talk to you a little bit. Um, before I start, I, 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 I will give some stimuli into this discussion. Before I start, I just wanted to clear something. I'm, uh, I'm from the Austrian Ministry for Climate Change, Environment, Energy, Mobility, Innovation and Technology. So it's, a very big, it's a very big ministry. We call it the Super Ministry. Uh, and uh, I'm not from the Department for Energy, but from the Department for Innovation and Technology. So I'm the tech guy in our ministry, and I'm dealing mainly with uh, high-tech, deep-tech topics, what we call key enabling technology. So it's AI, quantum technology, uh, nanotechnology, and so on. But definitely, we have a lot of interfaces to, uh, to energy, to the energy department. I will give you some more details. Second remark I wanted to start with is I like the concept of tech diplomacy. This is a very interesting phenom phenomenon that uh, now foreign policy is interested in what is happening in tech. And this is, um, well, this is interesting and this is very um, astonishing. Um, I just, uh, uh, listening to the, to the morning session, I was uh, taking out again my phone and looking about the market value of Apple. The current market value of Apple is uh, 2.3 trillion US dollar. So the, the company is of this incredible economic power, of this econ economic size. The, the current GDP of Italy is 2.2. Uh, so one of the big tech companies, and uh, there are others, uh, have more economic power than one of the G7 countries. Um, so tech diplomacy, you think, has to take into account that uh, the, the, the power situations around the world are different. And a lot of the big tech companies, well, they, uh, they, they don't own a country, uh, but they have a lot of, they have a lot of influence. <laughs> um, tech diplomacy, you think, will be necessary more and more in the future in emerging areas like AI, like quantum, like uh, neuronal computing. It's very important to uh, exchange uh, uh, process on these areas. Um, my ministry and my department, we have, uh, we have recently installed a fellowship program with an Austrian institute, the Institute for Humanities, IWM, uh, and we invited an uh, professor from Stanford who's uh, just finding, uh, finalizing her book with the title, Who Voted Big Tech? I, I like this title because it reflects a little bit where we stand with this, where we stand with this discussion. Okay, um, let's, let's start with the topic of uh, deglobalization technology and, uh, and, um, and energy. Uh, that you are addressing here in this in this panel. Um, first of all, I wanted to remind you or indicate that um, 
in Europe, the relation to what we have, uh, uh, to the relation to the technology world, has changed tremendously in the recent in the recent years. Um, we had uh, um, technology has been a kind of um, economic uh, 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 and part of the economic engine, where the main elements were. Um, focusing on competition between equals. Uh, so um, when we were talking about European uh, technological uh, uh, development, development of solar power, of, of uh, uh, renewable uh, energy technologies, it was kind of a competition between equal, uh, equal uh, geographies. This has changed tremendously. We are speaking now about sovereignty technological sovereignty. Um, energy is an important part of, uh, of this discourse. Why is this important? Because um, the last 10 years, uh, and especially the last three years, has, uh, well, brought something to, to, uh, uh, to our minds, which always has been there, but has been uh, visible on the last years. And this is the extreme vulnerability of our global value chains in the area of technology. I give you some, some examples, some few examples. Um, um, let's guess a, a, a semiconductor company and they have, well, are hundreds or are there thousands? Well, there are 16,000. The company who's producing semiconductors are, has 60,000 uh, suppliers. Um, um, the average, uh, the average uh, component they are using is crossing 50 to 60 times a national border. 50 to 60 times. And uh, at the same time, they are producing more chips than people on Earth, so one trillion a year. This is an industry which is incredibly uh, global, incredible, vulnerable to, uh, to uh, well, to uh, uh, geopolitical, geopolitical uh, disruptions to whatever you, there is for example, for example, given, uh, in the in the manufacturing of, of wafers, you need so what they call noble gases. Three of them are xenon, this is krypton, and neon. There's one company in the world who's producing 80% of it, and this company is in the in the area of uh, East Ukraine, and it was uh, it was uh, destroyed in the first uh, the first four weeks of the uh, of the attack of Russia. So what I'm, what I'm telling you here is that it is very important to have sustainable in, in, uh, uh, in, in those, uh, in those industries, you need to have a sustainable value chain. You have to understand the incredible, the vulnerable vulnerability of, uh, of the value chains. In the area of energy, uh, and there are a lot of studies already published from the uh, International Energy Organization of OECD. Of course, this has been analyzed uh, in, the last, in the last decades. Uh, it's about understanding which technologies you will have to develop um, for, well, reaching the, the 2050 goals, reaching the 2040 goals, <coughs> which type of uh, uh, renewable energies you will need and which part of those technologies are, um, well, which might be endangered by geopolitical uh, topics. In the, in the area of generation, there is this small-scale power networks and the control technology. Another example it has been in the Austrian newspapers. Um, there are companies uh, there's one company in I don't uh, I, I don't give you the name. In uh, you have this in, in all developed countries who are 
responsible for critical infrastructures in the energy sector. They are producing control systems for controlling uh, the grid, the networks, very complicated, very sophisticated companies. And they run on the basis of chips, uh, very complicated chips. And during the pandemic, and the disruption of those markets, uh, from one day or another, they didn't get any chips anymore. Two more, two, okay, two more minutes. So, and this is, well, this is up to a degree very dangerous. Hmm? Because if one company who is uh, substantial for, uh, for the uh, functioning of our power grids and isn't able to get the chips as necessary, this is very dangerous. Um, yeah, and then there's the storage topic. Batteries, for example. Batteries have a lot of, uh, uh, of rare earth materials, uh, some of them uh, at least. And there are, there are a lot of discussions where Europe can, uh, Europe can safeguard uh, their resources in this area. Okay, so. I think we can already trace a red line through our discussions here because we started with the solar panels. As you already said, um, need also rare earth materials. Going to the, the discussion of semiconductors, um, which has been, in, of course, in a lot of newspapers lately. Yeah. So I think um, going from these two, it's very, it would be very interesting to hear the, the insights of a Shanghai-based um, consultant now, because we all know that China is a big player in this area. Um, it's going to be significant. We, we need to um, realize what China's potential, or in general, a, a geopolitical superpower is going to be in that area. Thank you. Uh, can you go on? Then I would like to give you... Thank you very much. <clears throat> so my name is Gabor Holch, and indeed, uh, <clears throat> I'm Hungarian, but I started my company in China. You know, conferences, which caused... And uh, as an inter cultural leadership expert, mainly working on East-West issues, Asia-Europe issues. Um, I asked myself, what am I doing on this panel dealing with energy policy? So let me guide you through in five minutes my memory palace uh, as to what I found answering this question. And it went back to um, a guest lecture at, in this building when I studied at the Diplomatische Academy uh, in 99, I think it was in this room, but I'm not 100% sure about this, where uh, the gentleman who made the lecture said the following thing. Do you know that international car companies, specifically he mentioned Japanese, Korean, and American car companies, buy land in places like Madagascar in order to grow biomass, in order to power cars, and they have advanced agricultural technology over the local population that grows food in the other side of the same plot. So he said, be prepared, young people, because in a couple of decades, history will be about the, the war of machines and humans over food. And you know, uh, one thing that I decided is that <clears throat> the robots can only grab my salami and zemel uh, through my dead body. But then I went on and I was recruited by OSC out of the academy. I spent a couple of years in the former Yugoslavia. And then indeed I went to China. I spent the last 10, 20 years in China. That's where I started my consultancy. And I have been specialized in intercultural leadership, mainly for the high level executives of multinational companies. So let me give you a couple of interesting examples of the kind of cases that an intercultural leadership expert would deal with. When I work one-on-one, -on -one, mostly as an advisor or coach or trainer with these executives. So I have worked with companies like, um, Herr Wiesmüller mentioned chip companies. I did some work with ASML. I did some work with BASF, the largest uh, uh, chemical conglomerate from Germany. Some of the biggest users of energy as, as uh, corporations. Their entire business model was based on uh, European know-how cheap energy and resources from, among others, the former Soviet Union and available markets in Asia. So where do your loyalty uh, go? Where does your 
your responsibility go? Is it to your national identity? Is it to your shareholders? Is it to some higher goal? Like sometimes simplistically we say, do the right thing. And these are real human dilemmas in times like this. I did some work with automotive corporations like uh, Daimler-Benz, Porsche Group, uh, Japanese uh, car companies like Nissan. They are the ones who were accused of starting the war for, uh, for food. But um, let's look at an, one aspect of, on the automotive industry of energy, renewable energy and electric vehicles. So obviously, new companies like Tesla, but not all of them are from the West, also like Leo, like Geely from China, they are trying to out-innovate, out-compete each other into this future of more sustainability. But is it really only about creating a more sustainable future? Maybe, only maybe, for companies like Neo and Geely and Tesla, since they are creating a, more, a simpler product, that an electric car is a much more simple product than a, an internal combustion engine car, maybe this is their chance to break virtual monopolies by these old car companies, and maybe these car companies are trying to out-innovate them to keep those monopolies after all. Or I did some work with the Chinese National Renewable Energy Agency, where they had issues like this. They, they manufacture solar panels, wind turbines, which are going to be planted in certain places in Europe, and they had problems negotiating with local communities in Europe. Because, as they told me, Gabor, we are state-owned Chinese energy companies. We have no experience negotiating with local communities. Because in China, if the government says a wind turbine goes there, then it goes there. Nobody negotiates with the local community. So how do we do this in Europe, in the Middle East, in, in, in other places? So what I learned from this, just three very quick lessons. So the good news is we have no war for food between robots and humans by now. I'm delighted about that. But there is a lot of conflict between us humans for the, uh, those resources. And one thing, whether we like it or not, these resources are connected to each other. I mean, uh, we can talk about deglobalization and, and decoupling, but the food national borderlines. If, if you looked at but it, let's say from, from a, an alien civilization, completely unattached to humans, uh, a country like China trying to be self-sustainable while they consume half of the world's coal, or the United States trying to friend shore while they consume half of a lot of other forms of energy, and also they are net exporters of oil, that could be just funny, that the concept itself, that we are trying to withdraw from globalization. And I think most importantly, our goals are connected with each other. For example, as I learned in China, the European Union couldn't have reached the, 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 the stage, the picture that you described to us, without cheap manufacturing of solar panels and wind turbines from China. And China couldn't be on the right way to be sustainable according to its own goals without Western technology. So I think this is where we are now, as, as much as we would like to see it as deglobalization. But um, I think we have to ask some serious questions, and I hope that all of you will help us answer those questions as well. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Yeah, you, you made some important points and asked some interesting questions. Like, we are so connected with each other, but now we are trying to find ways to, to decouple, to deconnect to deglobalize, which is not as easy as as we would like to have it, of course. Um, but maybe um, with um, insights on the European Green Deal, do we maybe get some alternative way, maybe? Thank you. Thank First, you. thank you very much for, for the invitation. And, uh, I must say I'm uh, it's not by courtesy, extremely happy to, to be with you and listening to the other speakers. So many things that I thought to say were already said that I really feel at the right place. <laughs> Obviously, we think in, uh, in the same direction. Uh, but I won't start with, uh, with parliamentary insight uh, on the Green Deal. I, I will start with uh, a moment in uh, late uh, autumn or early winter of 2019. Uh, when Green Deal was already on the table, only, only as a concept. 
quite surprisingly, by the way, politically. Uh, and I must say, I'm uh, I'm really delighted to hear uh, first uh, in the uh, in the other room from uh, Mr. Uh, Oberreiter, uh, from the uh, Austrian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and now from Mr. Wiesmüller. Uh, that uh, diplomacy, uh, technology dip uh, diplomacy, tech diplomacy is already a priority. Uh, I, uh, I would dream of it. I didn't know it's such a reality in Austria. I'm happy. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very good example. Uh, I think that uh, this is really a significant part of the future. And the first, uh, the first perspective is to use the conflict between legislation in US and Europe uh, not to, to deepen it, not uh, to start a trade war, but to understand that we need uh, to revive the free trade uh, agreement negotiations, at least when it comes to new technology, at least for green tech. And then not to think of it as a West green tech bloc, uh, but bearing in mind the need to, to isolate Russia, maybe for a longer period from now, uh, to try to expand it uh, in a bigger uh, free trade tech community based on, uh, on shared priorities when it comes to energy, when it comes to technology. Because the technologies that we need to develop in order to, to be uh, based on renewables, either from geopolitical or climate perspective, are, are many. We have a huge field of, of development. And uh, things I, I read, I see, discussions I have show that we might even not need so much batteries than we think because uh, there are better technologies coming on, uh, on the horizon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for all your input and all your insights. Um, I would like to open the floor for questions now. If um, you have some, and how many minutes do we have left? 15 minutes, so we have 15 minutes for questions. Um, um, we will take three at a time, and then we, we have some questions. Two questions that went to Mr. Daniel regarding the dependability of, of solar. You know that for us in Sudan, we have more potential of solar than uh, the countries that we have spoken about in, in mm -hmm. East, I mean, Southern Europe. And how far is uh, solar is dependable to be like a best load for our power generation? Because we have a very big deficit in power generation, and people are thinking of going, for instance, for nuclear to provide the, the best. How far is uh, mm -hmm. My second question also maybe. You know, to Mr. Michael, in this issue of also of uh, renewable, can we we have a lot of uh, potential in Africa, uh, like I mean, potential for renewable and also resources that are needed for uh, in uh, for this renewable. Can in this in such a polarized world, and at the same time when we want to address the climate challenge, can we dream of some sort of a partnership between Africa, Europe, and China and India, where we in Africa provide the resources, and, I mean the natural resources and the market for this uh, renewable uh, cheap, uh, cheap industry, and also can they come contribute to the capital? Can we, in such a polarized world, can we think of this? Uh, uh, partnership in order to contribute to our uh, uh, common goal of uh, uh, climate, uh, fighting climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that, that was quite a, um, a long question. Two, two questions. So I will let you answer that first, and then we can go to the second and third question. Okay, then I'll start. So uh, on your question on the solar potential for Sudan, I don't know much about the current state of electricity production there. Probably a lot of oil. I'm not sure. But the solar potential is huge, definitely. Being in the Sahel zone, this is ba this is the best uh, best place uh, to use solar energy for different reasons. First of all, the solar output is generally very high. You have sun pretty much every day, and it's also very constant throughout the year. So here in Europe, of course, the further north you go, you have the problem that in summer you have a lot of sun, a lot of solar energy, 
But in winter, the, so, the solar energy uh, 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 production goes down massively. And of course, in the Sahel zone, this is not the case. You have uh, a lot of sun throughout the entire year. The company I work for, we're working uh, uh, in also in tropical regions. We're actually mainly working in the Maldives, in Southeast Asia, in the Seychelles. So geographically, kind of in the same area. Uh, the technology is so far that you can provide at least 80 to 90% of the entire energy used in these regions uh, with solar. Of course, for this, you need storage solutions, which are also on the are, which still have a lot of potential to develop, but are already quite good. Uh, you, can, you could achieve a solar share of at least 50, 60, 70% or, no, or more in Sudan, probably even with, by dra with drastically reducing your energy generation costs. Okay, thanks a lot for your excellent question. I'm, I'm, I'm probably not the right person to really give you a substantial good answer on it, uh, because I'm not so much expert in the energy energy challenges on, on a global scale. Uh, I do think that uh, your question indicates that in the question of uh, energy transformation, and this is the headline, the headline is a complete change of the way we we produce, we move, we organize our societies, our economies in this energy transition is a high potential of geopolitical dimensions, of new partnerships, of new alliances. Um, as far as I observe the discussion in Europe, we are not very far advanced on it. Uh, we are still very in our European Western bubble with respect to those topics. Um, uh, I hope, hope the experts would agree, but why not? I mean, uh, uh, I do remember there were, they have, have been piloting uh, piloting uh, endivious Siemens, I think. but what is really or uh, I, I have to confess, I just don't know, I can't, can't really give you a concrete answer on this. May I answer? Can I take to this? Yeah, of course. To your question whether there could be an Africa-EU-China alliance, the interesting thing is I think 10 years ago we would have answered absolutely. Today we are not so sure. And the, but it's not just for geostrategic reasons, it's also because uh, technology-wise, for example, if you look at the technological needs, um, a, a lot of success stories in, in Africa is actually not based on the latest technology. Basic technology suffices, so the latest technology for Europe might not be needed. What is needed is the implementation, that consistently you can install the infrastructure of, of all that the colleagues have mentioned. But there is a problem there is China sees any project in Africa as a, as a chance not only to cooperate with Africa in terms of, let's say, energy generation and storage, but also once you switch to Chinese solar technology, then why shouldn't you use Chinese traffic lights and Chinese uh, traffic cameras and Chinese cars and Chinese airports and so on? And, and the EU and other Western powers see this as a threat to basically take away markets. So there is, there is a lot of direct and, and indirect um, uh, conflict there. And I think this is one of the reasons why it is, it is more there are other reasons as well, I think. There's one political, one technological. But I think, uh, again, to, to overcome these difficulties, this is what we are all struggling with these days. OK, thank you. Then a second question. Hello, my name is Mark Swan. Um, I'm a student of economics in Vienna and an intern at the European Commission representation. Um, I have a question for Mr. Wiesmüller and Mr. Kahneman. Um, today, uh, in the previous panel, was discussed uh, that uh, in, in the USA, for example, the, the semiconductor uh, producing companies have a lot of leverage now in negotiations with the Biden uh, administration, the trade war with China. And so my question is, um, uh, multinational corporations are as global as it gets. Uh, what can be done to limit uh, their, their power and their, their interests, their influence, to a beneficial um, extent? when it comes to uh, yeah, technology and also the energy sector on global scale. Thank you. Who would like to start? Do you want to start? Yeah, yeah why not? Uh, of course, it's, it's really a million dollar question. Uh, I don't think anyone has, uh, has the answer. 
but uh, obviously we uh, we have the problem. We have it from uh, uh, one of them being, uh, for example, value chains, as, as Mr. Wiesmuller especially uh, mentioned, uh, that we felt so painfully, and we still feel, by the way, I, uh, I sold my car in the beginning of the, the COVID crisis, and I still can't find anything suitable on the market <laughs> because you simply have no uh, no offer, no enough uh, production. Uh, but uh, we have uh, much higher uh, risk, for example, when we uh, speak of breakthrough technologies and companies with uh, trillions of, uh, of dollars of turnover. Uh, and if these technologies are critical to achieve certain uh, of our political uh, social objectives, we might, uh, we might be in a situation when we don't face a Russian or Chinese monopoly on certain market, uh, but uh, let's say the Tesla monopoly on, on the same market, which is not the case with electric cars, <laughs> thanks God, but uh, still uh, an, obvious, uh, an obvious risk. Uh, we know the, the basic European answer to your question. Uh, it is in regulation. It's uh, not by coincidence that, uh, that Europe is considered the, the regulatory superpower on Earth. And not only we get negative connotation, it, uh, it's quite often that uh, US policymakers are trying to, to take example of European regulations, make it a bit simpler, but policies act in Europe are in my I view a pretty decent, if not perfect, example to how to, to deal uh, with uh, uh, mega multinationals. Yet implementation is to come. So let's, uh, let's see how it, how it goes. They are already active legislation. Whereas the, the US, uh, also to use my own example with the Inflation Reduction Act, normally uh, uses a much tougher approach. Uh, uh, a combination of uh, fiscal strength, because be much more centralized, uh, they have uh, extreme fiscal strength and root uh, political uh, force, once again bearing in mind uh, the size of their market and the uh, very strong instruments of their government that we, for good or bad, don't have in Europe. Thank you. Um, yeah, it was an excellent answer. Um, I can't really... My answer would be mainly that, well, the, the main answer that Europe can offer with respect to big tech uh, or those companies is regulation, definitely. And I can think, well, it's my feeling that GDPR, AI Act, uh, the DMA, it makes the tour around the globe. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, Japanese and Indonesian uh, uh, politicians are looking what we're doing in Europe and if this couldn't be a model for themselves. With respect, to, with respect to the microelectronic industry, this is a different case. I wouldn't say, uh, yeah, in, yeah. Uh, it's, it's, really, it's really important to understand that in some, in some uh, I mean, those, those companies are too big to fail. They have, they have such an enormous importance for our economy uh, that we have to have, uh, uh, alternatives uh, to cope with the case that uh, they, they won't work anymore for us. Yeah. Thank you. And we have um, two or three more minutes for one last question, and then we have to wrap it up, unfortunately. Thank you very much. My name is Kobi Jan Bayern. I'm also a master student here. Um, and I have uh, two questions, actually. Um, first, Mr. Reinhardt, you mentioned um, the electricity production gap in Italy. Um, is this, is Italy increasing its um, electricity production capacity? And the second question is regarding um, the, the not constant production of renewable energies, in particular solar and uh, wind energy. So what are the possibilities of saving that energy and how, how plausible is that to that, that, that this can be actually achieved. Mm -hmm. I can say is they have a goal to increase, to double their current solar capacity, to double it by 2030, which in my opinion is by far not enough. Right now they have around 20 gigawatts of solar installed and they want to have around 40 gigawatts uh, by 20, 2030. Just to compare with Germany, Germany has set a goal of 200 gigawatts 
by 2030. Germany is right now adding almost one gigawatt of solar capacity every month. Uh, and I think Italy should have similar goals, especially because they have even a lot more solar potential through a lot more sun, a lot higher solar output. Now, coming to the other question. Um, so there are different, uh, uh, different aspects to this. Um, one is uh, storing, storing electricity during daytime for overnight use. That's one topic. There we are already fairly, uh, we, the technology is already fairly advanced. And what you have to say is that by the, the more solar we're adding in any country, the, high, the lower the price is uh, in, in the current electricity market setup. So uh, uh, what we will have soon, or what we already have now, for example, in Germany, that in summer, during midday hours, the electricity cost, the electricity price goes down almost to zero, which means that you can get electricity almost for free because there's such an oversupply of electricity. Now, this opens quite an interesting market for uh, uh, energy storage system operators. You basically buy a big battery system, you, you uh, charge the battery system during midday, and you feed it back into the grid in the evening or at nighttime at a high business model, which is starting now and which will grow massively in the next couple of years for sure. Um, when it comes to uh, the seasonal, seasonal variance, yeah, th that is a little bit more difficult. Uh, what you have to say in this regard is uh, we have enough renewable energy sources in Europe to power the continent pretty much 100% with renewable energies but you don't have them everywhere at every time. So this means uh, we have to further increase uh, uh, electricity trade. We have to further in, uh, improve the grid, the, the uh, grids in Europe to transport electricity always from there where it is being produced to there where it's not being produced at any certain point in time. Uh, when we look at countries like Spain, Italy, or Southern France, even in winter, they have a fairly good solar energy production. And that's why I was saying at the beginning, uh, uh, it would make a lot of sense, especially for these countries, to invest heavily into solar, because even in winter, they can uh, export a lot of electricity to, to Northern Europe. Um, that's the main answer. Uh, other technologies, which are, of course, also are evolving, it's a lot in the news, it's uh, uh, hydrogen. Uh, many consider this as a good future technology. Um, for this to make sense, uh, uh, or where this makes sense, is again if you have basically free electricity, which is often the case during midday hours when you have an oversupply of renewable power. So these are all solutions which I think will play a big role uh, in the future. And uh, uh, there, there are many uh, uh, studies which have, which have assessed the feasibility of close to 100% renewable energy uh, supply in, uh, in the European Union by 2030, by 2040, and many of them say it's very feasible. And also at uh, maintaining the current market prices of electricity or even lowering them. Okay. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. So to wrap it all up, last year we kind of saw the dangers of globalization and of being dependent on energy of a, of a superpower. But during the discussions, I guess it was also vital and obvious that it that for such a vital we already have promising technologies but also a complex geopolitical and geoeconomic situation and but i guess what we can all agree upon is that tech diplomacy can be is is significant and i guess we can all be and are already part of the the solution and a way to create a solution to the problems but I guess it won't be easy, but we will see. Thank you, thank you all, and the audience for also for your interesting questions. Thank you. Thank you.